This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So we're going to change uh, pace a little bit and get away from the exciting non-invasive testing for, their t for, the, for the lower extremity and talk about the exciting stuff with biomechanical assessment of the diabetic foot when and how. Here are my disclosures. And one of my favorite quotes is by Thomas Campbell who said, the coming events cast their shadows ahead. And if you look at this particular patient here, you can see that not only does this patient have a callus subfirst metatarsal head, but this patient now has a hemorrhagic area within the callus. Most likely this patient has a full-blown ulceration and possibly even an abscess. And the question is really appropriate. This quote is really appropriate because when we're evaluating diabetic foot, we can really predict weeks and maybe months ahead of time where these patients will develop these problems. And that's what this talk will mostly focus on. Quick quiz for the audience. Okay, very nice. All right, and I'll answer that question in a few minutes, and I think it will be self-evident in a couple of minutes. A few statistics about the diabetic foot ulcer that we all need to know about. The incidence of diabetic foot ulcers is two to seven percent per year, and what that really means is approximately one million ulcerations will occur this year and the next. Eighty-five percent of all non-traumatic amputations are preceded by an ulcer. Thirty to fifty-six percent of the ulcerations will develop an infection, and up to twenty percent of ulcers will lead to an amputation. Patients with diabetic foot ulcers are 30 times more likely to require an amputation than the same patients without foot ulcers. And I think the most important statistic for, to, for this talk is the following. Up to 83% of diabetic foot ulcers that have healed will have a recurrence within 12 months. Here in this slide, what you're seeing is a classic neuropathic diabetic foot ulcer. And you can see that one is on the first metatarsal head, there's another in the hallux interphalangeal joint, sub-second metatarsal head, plantar lateral midfoot. All of these are classic neuropathic diabetic foot ulcers. And one of the most important questions that I ask my students and residents when we evaluate these patients is, tell me why this ulcer is in that particular location. Because if you cannot tell me why that ulcer is in that location, then we cannot do patient justice. We cannot treat them appropriately, nor can we prevent reulceration from occurring. So this is a must. And there is a reason why these ulcers occur in these spots. Gail Ryber and her group elucidated this causal, common causal pathway for formation of diabetic neuropathic ulcers. In 1999, they published their paper in, in uh, Diabetes Care, and what they looked at, several things. Anatomic factors such as deformity, pathophysiologic factors such as infection, vascular disease, neuropathy, and environmental factors such as minor trauma. And guess what they found? The most common causal pathway that leads to a diabetic neuropathic ulcer is neuropathy, deformity, and tra minor trauma. If we break this down a little bit further, we're looking at specifics. Neuropathy, minor trauma, and deformity were by far the most common causes that lead to an ulceration. And if you look down the list, you see ischemia is much lower. So this is a great, and this uh, plays right along in that question that I ask you, and this is where the confusion is still out there. Ischemia is not a major risk factor for development of neuropathic diabetic foot ulcers. Ischemia is a great risk factor for non-healing, and it's a major risk factor in lead, leading to, towards amputations, but it's not, and again, I say it's not a risk factor for a neuropathic uh, 
ulcer, diabetic foot ulcer. So why is this important? Why is this equation important for us? Because if we can understand this equation, then potentially we can intervene appropriately and prevent these ulcers from occurrence and reduce that 83% recurrence rate within the next 12 months. Now, if we look at them independently, can we really reverse neuropathy? And the answer is no. Can we do something about minor trauma? Probably not. The patient is still going to step on a thumbtack. The patient is still going to step on a nail. He's, he or she is going to wear a shoe that's a little too tight, develop an ulcer that will eventually lead to an, ulcer, to an ulceration, full-blown ulcer. And the only one that possibly we can mitigate or reduce is the deformity. Talking about deformities, what do we mean when we talk about deformities? Well, here's the classic type of deformities. There are different types of deformities that we see. The most common ones are hallux uh, valgus or bunion formation, hammer toe formations. You can see that some of these toes are overlapping. Some of these toes are now dorsally dislocated, further causing retrograde buckling of the metatarsal heads and an increasing peak plantar pressure. Because really what we're dealing here with is increased peak plantar pressures that lead to formation of the ulcer. Here's a, here's a picture of a deformity, but this is more of a structural rigid deformity. And when we evaluate deformities, we're trying to figure out whether the deformity is flexible or it's rigid. A flexible deformity is one that we can manually reduce. A rigid deformity is the one that we can't reduce, and it's the rigid deformities that give us a much more hard time healing these ulcers and lead to recurrence than the flexible deformities. Under the umbrella of deformities, we talk about limitation of range of motion. There are two major joints in the foot that we need to evaluate. One of them is the great toe joint, and typically we need at least 60 degrees of great toe range of motion at the metatarsophalangeal joint during the gait phase in order to reduce pressures in the distal joints. If we have minimal range of motion, such as you see here on the gray toe joint, we have about 20, 30 degrees, the motion has to be taken up by a distal joint. And this picture on the right shows you the classic location for a neuropathic diabetic foot ulcer, one of the most common locations, the hallux interphalangeal joint, mainly because there is what we call a hallux limitus, or limitation of the gray toe joint range of motion. Another important joint in the foot is the ankle. We need at least 10 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion to prevent high pressures on the forefoot. And you can see an example here, the top uh, left and top right, where the patient has very minimal ankle range of motion, and the bottom pictures, bottom left and bottom right, the patient has at least 10 degrees, and here you can see it's 20, 25 degrees, which plays a huge role in reducing peak plantar pressures on the forefoot. Lavriol did a, a study, a longitudinal study over two years, looking at over 1,600 patients. And what his group did, they looked at peak plantar pressures of the forefoot. The results of their study showed that there were significantly higher risk, higher peak plantar pressures in a diabetic patient with zero degrees ankle range of motion. What they also found was that longer duration of diabetes increases the risk of having equinus. Equinus is lack of dorsiflexion of the ankle. Anything less than 10 degrees, we call that equinus. So why does diabetes do that? Well, we've known over several years now the diabetes causes glycosylation of the tendons and ligaments, and that makes the, makes the tendon a little bit thicker, a little bit less mobile, and therefore range of motion is impacted. So this leads us into an evaluation. What should we do, when, what should we look for when we, when we evaluate a diabetic foot? Well, the first start with looking at a callus pattern. If the patient has calluses in the bottom of the foot, if the patient has calluses on top of his, of his uh, hammer toes or toes, those are pre-ulcerative lesions. Anybody with neuropathy, a diabetic patient with neuropathy that has a callus, that's a site of a pre-ulcerative lesion. That's exactly where these patients are gonna ulcerate. Are there any foot deformities? And if there are any deformities, are these deformities flexible or are they rigid? And then we eventually follow up with a radiographic examination to really identify the severity of these deformities and the extent of these deformities. So looking at these individually, when we look at this picture on the right, you can see that this patient has calluses sub-first and sub-fifth metatarsal. Well, guess what? This is exactly where the ulcers will occur if we don't intervene. 
If we don't give them an appropriate custom orthotic, if we don't intervene with shoes or shoe modification, this patient will eventually ulcerate. So this is, again, something that's predictable, and this event would be predicted in um, casting events uh, come, show the shadows ahead of time. Here's an example, again, the same example of the gray toe joint. We evaluate the range of motion of the toe joint. If that toe joint is limited, we have to be careful. And if there is a callus under the hallux interphalangeal joint, this is a patient that truly needs orthotics and shoes or uh, some form of modification, maybe a metatarsal bar or a rocker sole shoe. Here's a typical transmetatarsal amputation that we're looking for ankle range of motion. The picture on the bottom left is showing that this patient has at least 10 degrees of range of motion. And uh, if they have at least 10 degrees of range of motion, we probably are pretty safe. But if this patient has zero degrees of range of motion or very limited range of motion, then we can expect this patient to ulcerate at the distal aspect of the transmet. And if the patient has his toes, then we can potentially expect this patient to ulcerate underneath the metatarsal heads or the toes. I'd like to point out um, this picture here, give you an idea of a couple of other deformities that we see. If you look at this patient carefully here, you see that there's absolutely no arch. As a matter of fact, not only is there no arch, but there is a plantar prominence here, what we call a rocker bottom deformity. If you take an x-ray of this patient, you can see what happened. This patient has complete collapse of the midfoot. We call this a charco deformity. And that osseous, the bony prominence here, directly corresponds to where that rocker bottom deformity is. This would be considered a rigid deformity, and, and we would expect this patient to ulcerate right underneath the midfoot area, right underneath where this rocker bottom deformity is. So again, something that is very predictable. The picture on the bottom here, an ulcer sub-fifth sub metatarsal head. The question is, can we predict this? And why did this patient get this ulcer? Why wasn't it located under the first, second, third, or fourth metatarsal head? Was this just by chance? Or did, is there a reason why this occurred? If we look at the x-rays of this patient, you can tell that metatarsal heads two, three, and four were surgically excised in the, pro in the past. So now this patient only has metatarsal heads one and five left, and every time this patient steps, there is a high pressure point right underneath the fifth metatarsal. Every step causes peak pl increased peak plantar pressures. Eventually, that leads to a callus formation, and eventually that leads to an ulcer. So this was preventable. I'm going to leave you with um, the last slide of this talk. And this is a study that was performed by Mueller and colleagues and published in 2003. And they looked at two groups. Both groups had diabetic foot ulcers. One group was treated with total contact cast. The other group was treated with total contact cast and tendo Achilles lengthening. At the end of two years, they found that there was 81% recurrence rate of ulcers that were treated, that were healed just with a total contact cast versus a 38% recurrence rate with the ulcers that were healed with total contact cast and tendo Achilles lengthening. Now, why is that, why is this study important? Because this study supports the notion that if we can evaluate this, this patient's foot appropriately, if we can understand and predict whether there's lack of range of motion, or where there's callus patterns, where there's rigid deformities, then potentially we can intervene with shoes, orthotics, or even, in this particular case, surgical intervention, what I would call a minor surgical intervention, then we can reduce the recurrence rate of diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, that will end my talk, and I will uh, answer any questions if you have any. Typical diabetic foot, Charcot's foot, rocker bottom foot with an ulcer. Are we not worried about underlying osteo as well? It's a great question. Uh, yes, just to, to give you a quick answer about Charcot and osteo. If, if the patient has Charcot, that does not mean he or she has osteo. If the patient has Charcot and an ulcer, and that ulcer tracks down to bone or has exposed bone, then you have to be highly suspicious that there's osteo going on in addition to Charcot.